So uh, my name is Erin Frazier. I'm the Director of Special Services and Inclusive Education, and uh, we work birth to 22 on my team, special education. And with us, we have Fran Bodkin, who is a speech language pathologist. Um, she has worked in this field for 30 years, um, and she runs her own business called the Center for Communication in Sanford, Maine. And uh, she is going to take us through this webinar um, and let us know all of the great things that uh, we should know as educators in the field. So go ahead, Fran. All right. Thank you all, first of all, for taking some time because I know how busy um, it is to be working in the schools, particularly right now. So I appreciate you guys sharing this time with us today. Um, please feel free to type questions into the Q&A because Aaron will be keeping an eye on them and will stop us when things come up so we can address them because those of you out there who know me know that once I get going, I'm going to get really excited and I'm going to want to keep on going and having these great conversations. So if we need to talk about something a little bit more or flesh it out um, for your particular situations, please just make a note of that. Um, I know some of you out there know a lot about communication, but we're going to talk about what that looks like when your students are struggling to communicate verbally um, and how we can support them functionally to use that language throughout their day, home, community, school, um, and how we're a partner in that piece. Because we we have an important role and sometimes it's hard to sort out exactly where to go with that. So let's jump in and start talking about things that we love. All right, Amanda, bring us to the next slide. This is just a little quote from Brene Brown. If anyone has read any of Brene Brown's powerful work, uh, this is a quote that Aaron and I both really thought was applicable for our conversation today. When we don't have the language to talk about what we're experiencing, our ability to make sense of what's happening and share it with others is severely limited. Without accurate language, we struggle to get the help we need. We don't always regulate or manage our emotions and experiences in a way that allows us to move through them productively and our self-awareness is diminished. So we can all think of students that we've worked with of at many different ages that fits this quote and how important this is to being a productive, connected, engaged member in all of our communities. So... I think that's the quote we're bearing in mind as we move forward. Go ahead, Amanda. So we're gonna be talking about how functional communication impacts us across settings. How do we do that evaluation? Who does that evaluation? How we can get alternate supports in place? What are some types of assisted technology? That changes constantly right now. And it's amazing how that field has changed how we approach communication. How do you support your students across settings and reach their full potential? And how to support positive behavior, behaviors communication. So how are we supporting those as people in using those communication skills instead of some of those behaviors. Um, how do we get moving forward if we're stuck or in a plateau? And how we can have fun with communication because nothing will make you feel better or laugh harder than when your student is really able to independently let you know what's going on. So those are some of the things we're gonna talk about today. We can dive on in. All right, Amanda, next slide. All right, this is a really powerful clip. I'm hoping if Amanda clicks on it, we can see it. It's about six minutes long. I don't know if it'll work or not. We can give it a try. I saw your little spinny wheel. Let's see. No, nope, maybe not. Still trying. Okay. But what you might see, if we can get it to pull up, is a really powerful story of a young woman who was nonverbal for most of her academic career. And when she had access to functional communication, how powerful that was and where it's led her as an adult. And just in knowing that 
putting communication devices in our students' hands does not magically create language, but allowing our students to have voices can bring them to a lot of powerful places. Um, and we might have that web link to pop up there, maybe in the... Trying. All right. We're going to keep going, Fran, yep. and then we will send that. Uh, send it out. Check topic. it out. Okay. Check it out. It's six minutes long. It's pretty powerful. And again, it's really about how we can empower our students to have a full functional life connected with academics and vocation and their community and not assuming that we know things about them until they can communicate with us. I think it's the really powerful message in that clip. All right, so that puts us at slide, I think number five. five. You could probably click on resume slideshow. Oh my goodness, is it not showing on your end? It's not showing on my end. Is it showing on your end, Erin? Nope, it's frozen. All right, maybe stop mm -hmm. it and just restart it. That's okay. Yeah. I'm just gonna keep on talking. So that's totally fine. <laughs> um, so, you know, we all know those students that we're worried about right now, today. And what I can tell you all is there's been a lot of impact since COVID, particularly on the young kiddos coming into school. Um, we have a large number of young children who are not developing communication, um, who really had the impact of COVID hit them hard. Um, and they're in our schools and we're working with them. And that's a really important piece to, to address, to move them forward. I see a lot of kiddos that are coming in nonverbal right now who once they get some communication skills are really demonstrating a lot of important growth. So we can't wait either. Um, we need to really look at what they need now to move forward. And we're seeing it in the early childhood system. We're seeing it in the pre-Ks. We're seeing it in kindergarten. But then while the AAC field is kind of backed up because everybody needing supports, it's also impacting our older students and how we can make sure we're keeping them on track and keeping them moving forward. Um, so it's it's really a multi-tiered problem that we're seeing across the board and working to address. So COVID-19, absolutely impacting us. Um, parents being at home with kids and wanting to support them is a really big issue that we're facing right now as well that we're trying trying to um, get them linked in to the process um, and then how do we advocate for our students to move this process forward because it feels really big sometimes and we can do that together all right next slide Amanda Aaron actually has it now. <laughs> Do you see it? I see it. Okay. Next slide, Aaron. Okay, so what is communication? Communication lets you meet your needs with a variety of people in a variety of places. It is not just in the speech room. It is not just in the special education classroom, right? It needs to travel with you out there in the universe. And the fastest way for all of us to communicate is verbally. So students want to communicate verbally, but they don't all start in the same place. So if you can't verbalize your thoughts, wants, needs, you may see behavior in place of that. And so that is what we really need to address. Um, augmentative alternate communication, it supports functional communication in the moment and teaches those important skills. So for those of us who are very anxious that voice output systems might prevent students from learning to be verbal, my advice is usually it supports students in developing those verbalization skills. It's giving models, it's giving them access to communication while you're working on those skills. Um, and it's not limited to voice output system. There may be low-tech, mid-tech, high-tech options. There are communication boards, there's 
you know, writing on dry erase boards. There are iPad apps, there are GoTalks, there are all kinds of devices that don't all have to be high tech pieces to put into place. Okay, Amanda, next slide, or Aaron, whoever's running the show over there. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> um, who benefits from AAC assessments and interventions? Almost everybody, to be honest. Our students who are nonverbal, our students with an oral or verbal apraxia, so their speech sounds are not clear. Um, if you need help developing functional language, AAC might be for your student. If they're not able to clearly communicate wants and needs to a variety of people, even if you understand what they're saying, that does not mean they're a functional communicator. If you're confused by a student's behavior, look at the communication. What are they trying to tell you with that behavior? So all of the students in this list, plus there are probably many more, could use some communication support. Next slide. So the slide we just skipped over, you don't have to even go back because I know it. Uh, I, I'm thinking of so many examples because this is a day in the life and it's a day in most of your lives too. The students that are showing us behavior, right? And, and what we learn from that. And these are just two examples of two students that, that pop to my mind when I think of when was functional communication support really powerful. Middle school student, banging their head on anything they could bang their head on, um, had to wear a helmet all day, every day, everywhere they went. And what did we figure out for that student is we needed to teach them refusal vocabulary. We don't always like that, but I would much rather have a student have refusal vocabulary or be able to ask for help or a break than banging their head student no longer wears a helmet. I think that's a huge, powerful improvement in their life if they can communicate a need for help, a break, um, or no, I don't wanna do that right now. Sometimes it's not an option, but they have a right to say it uh, instead of hurting themselves. Or an elementary school student biting the hand, constantly biting their own hand when they're excited, happy, upset, sad, any time that emotional regulation got too high, the hand would go in the mouth, right? We had to think about what is this student needing? Well, requesting an alternate form, like a chewy tube, being able to let us know we need a chewy tube, or I need help, or I need a break, or I'm happy, or I'm excited. Helping that student be able to communicate those needs and thoughts, reduce that behavior. So, you know, if you're thinking of, I'm sure we're all thinking of behaviors we saw today that we would like to eliminate. Now, what I'll tell you is, does that happen overnight? It does not happen overnight. That is a concerted effort for every single team member working with that student. That's the focus of the moment. We're gonna work on this communication skill across setting, across communication partners until we see some gains. Um, and it does take time, but it makes a powerful difference. Next slide. So when do we want to start looking at evaluating these skills in depth? When the behaviors are, are interfering with interactions, education, safety, when students are isolated. Um, not all of our student behavior is overt. Sometimes our behavior is withdrawal. And when those, those students appear isolated, we need to look at that too. Um, when a student cannot independently get their needs met, when we are guessing about what their needs are, we need to be looking at assessing those skills. When they stop progressing in their communication beyond just asking for things that I want, it is wonderful for you to get to that stage to ask for what you want, but if that's where it ends, that's a very beginning entry-level communication skill, and we need to move beyond that at some point. Um, and if you're unsure of what the next step is, that means it's time for an evaluation to see what that next step is. Next slide. All right, are there any questions at this point, Erin, in that piece of the presentation? 
before we start talking about the actual Good, let me check process. let me check um we do have the chat disabled i should probably tell you that we are only taking questions right now so um questions we are taking and the chat feature is turned off so uh nope we have no questions yet all right so that's that is the overview about why we would want to be looking at functional communication components now here comes the how and this is the part that sometimes can feel overwhelming but it's okay because it's a group effort the first thing we have to do is start that evaluation process and the speech language pathologist in your program is a great place to start. Not every speech language pathologist feels as comfortable with the augmentative evaluation communication component. That is okay. There's still the place to start because we need to look at a child's language skills, what they are doing, and then if there needs to be um, more people brought in that have some of that augmentative alternate communication experience, then that's something you would wanna bring in as an add-on to your evaluation team. So having that conversation first with your speech language pathologist is, is step number one. Teacher input forms are a great way to start pulling in why do we need to look at these skills and what's the impact in the educational process? They're right on the DOE website. Um, and, and you can get a lot of input from a lot of different teachers across the building. Um, so I think that's another important place to, to begin this process. The teacher role is huge because the teacher is the one who, who can see those interactions in the classroom, how is it impacting the educational plan, but also the teacher is often that primary contact person with the parent. And sometimes the parent is the one that is saying, hey, I'm concerned. We're not able to communicate well at home. Um, when grandma and grandpa come over or I have to go to the grocery store. Um, and, and that is a really important contact point for starting this evaluation process. So there can be a lot of team members involved. Um, if your student has access issues, it may involve the OT or the PT or the teacher of the visually impaired or the teacher of the deaf. Um, there may be a lot of, of different folks involved in this process, but start with talking with your speech language pathologist to see what, what their perspective is and who might need to come on board with the team to get it started. And speech language pathologist, if you're out there listening, if you're not comfortable, reach out for help. Absolutely, that is a wonderful professional skill to have. We've done these remotely through Zoom, trying to support folks um, that maybe don't have access to other professionals to help them out. Reach out, let us know if you need help. Next slide. Before we move on, I will just let you know that we will um, send you the link for this form. And the speech language, the area of speech language has several different teacher input forms. They're not required forms for a state, but they are certainly helpful, even helping you kind of frame and think about functional communication. So I know you can't read any of this, is, but we will send you the link with the slideshow. And there's, our, there's an articulation one, there's a language one, there's voice, there's fluency, and they are really helpful when you're trying to sort out what is the academic impact of this speech and language issue. Absolutely. So anytime I walk into a functional communication evaluation, step number one, what are those positive reinforcers? What is the motivating factor that we are communicating for? What are you already doing? What, what does that student like? Uh, do they like music? Do they like bubbles? Do they like toys? Are there puzzles, fidgets? I don't know. What is it that this student loves? I have students that love letter tiles, that love writing on dry erase boards. I mean, 
it's not up to us to decide what the items are that we want to look at. We want to know what does the student like? What does the student want to tell us about? That is step number one. I like those items to be consumable. And by consumable, I don't mean edible. By consumable, I mean they stop. They go away. They need to be re-requested. So if it's music, it comes to the end of the song. If it is our, if they're bubbles, they pop. If, um, and some of you have seen me do some of these things before, if it's a toy, oh, somehow magically I managed to turn it off or have it in my hands so that we need to see if this is a really powerful reinforcer. Um, and finding the most powerful reinforcers is step number one. And we can't assume that we know what that is. It might be visual. It might be tactile. It might be a scent. It could be a taste. Um, there are lots of things out there. Our occupational therapists know a lot about different type of consumable reinforcers, and we can learn a lot from them. Um, those sensory needs, we don't want to tip anyone over um, too far into a sensory spin, but we want them to want to communicate. So locating what they want to communicate about is step number one. Next slide. So communicative intent is the groundwork for getting all of those other functional communication skills on board. Um, if that student is not establishing connection, either by moving or having some kind of physical action, eye contact, vocalization, verbalization, um, if there's no communicative intent from that student, we can't shape it. That's why the reinforcers are important. We can all probably think of the student that sat very quietly and really did not want to communicate with us. Well, motivating that communication is really the essentials. Um, we're going to create opportunities for our students to communicate all day, every day, all throughout their school and home environments. Um, maybe you're having things that they're interested in visible to them in sealed, clear containers, but they can't access them without requesting them. Um, but what is that student already doing to communicate? We're going to start where they're at and we're going to bring it along. So either we're developing communicative intent or we're taking how they're already communicating and trying to shape that along in the process. Next slide. All right. Once we have the intent down, then we start skill building. When we start skill building, we have to think about what are those critical communication skills that students need to use to be successful across environments. Easiest place to start, request, requesting wants and needs. You, they can ask for those things they want. That is a ground level skill, but we want to move on from there. We want them to be able to request help, assistance, a break. We want them to be able to say no appropriately, even if we need them to do a certain task because it prevents some behaviors to communicate no. We want them to be able to say yes or acceptance. Responding to wait is a huge skill. Delayed gratification becomes really important. Once you've taught communicative intent and the ability to request what you want, then you're now in the negotiation stages of wait and no, that's not a choice right now. Um, and so these skills start to become a lot more complicated. We want them to be able to follow directions, transitions to be able to stop an activity, complete it and move on to something else, really important. And following that visual schedule gives them a map and a plan that they can start to organize their thinking and their environment. So these skills are all really important once we get communicative intent down and then we start moving through these other stages. Okay, next slide. All right, anyone, were there any questions about any of that before we go into our different types of technology? Not, no questions yet. So low tech, low tech, does not talk to you, um, 
has some advantages in that they can be very quick and easy to get up and off the ground. You don't usually have to order anything. You can make a picture exchange communication system book. You can laminate pictures and put them on Velcro. You can get symbols, objects. Um, you can start doing gestures and sign. You can have communication boards, dry erase boards right off the bat pulling in whatever you can to get the communication off the ground is where to start. Um, a couple of, of thoughts to have. One, if your student is using a picture exchange communication system, which a lot of our kids start with, it's a great place to start communicative intent. Really important that they have not only one at school, but the exact same material available to them at home. Um, also really important if your student is a preschooler moving into school and this is what they've been using, that that travels with them to school because they're now starting a new communication environment and they really need the communication system they've been using to travel with them. And I, I've known kids that have used PECs as preschoolers and have shown up to kindergarten with no book, no communication tools. And, and that's a, a rough way to start any process from scratch. I also know kids that use PECs really successfully at school, but then they don't have the same system at home. Um, so things start to stall out. And I know making a whole PECs book is a lot of work, but it is important to recognize this is not just a PECs book. This is your student's means of effective communication. It is like your larynx. It's your voice box for those kids. We need them to have access across settings. Um, some students automatically gravitate to some signs and some gestures. That is wonderful. And some students work in settings where they are using American Sign Language in those settings as a primary means of communication. That is an appropriate place to be using American Sign Language. However, if we have students working with us in settings where we are not primarily communicating with American Sign Language, and they are not communicating in environments where that is the language being used, teaching them American Sign Language is not necessarily a functional means of communication. It might be a starting point. It might be communicative intent. We might be using some single word vocabulary and we need to honor and recognize that. But we also need to recognize American Sign Language has its own grammatical structure, its own syntax. It is its own language. Um, so, you know, just keep that in mind if that is a direction that your team wants to go in that how are you going to support that student functionally to grow and develop more and more and more communication? So just a thought. Next slide. There are mid-tech options. And I like some of these mid-tech options. Um, the Logan Tech is what's pictured right there. Logan Tech is pretty interesting. It has tiles and you record a message on the tile and you can have pages and pages and pages of tiles. Um, you can use objects on those tiles if a student doesn't do well with pictures. Um, this was actually developed by a dad who had a child with some severe communication needs that couldn't... Um, really see or manage the visual aspect of the PEX pictures. So you can make them large, you can make them textured, you can, again, put objects on them. Um, and, and those tiles, when you put them on the Logan Tech, will read what's on the tile. Um, so that's kind of a neat um, option that I've seen some kids move from PEX to some of these mid-tech options on their way to either becoming fully verbal or um, using voice output systems at a higher tech level. Um, another option that we've used and really liked is uh, something called a GoTalk. It's a pretty sturdy um, 
kind of like an iPad, but sturdier. Um, and it's only a communication tool. It has just the GoTalk app on it. Um, and you can record several layers of buttons on it. It's, it's a little limited in how much it can hold, but it's a nice midway option to see, are we going to hire tech voice output systems? Or is this a way to support my student into becoming a verbal communicator? Um, iPads are always, you know, a, a great choice for schools that have extra technology lying around. Um, there is plenty of software out there, Perla Quota Go, Touch Chat. There are some free demo. I know Touch Chat has a 30-day free trial out there. Um, a word about those iPads, they should be a dedicated communication device. If you're going to be using it for communication, that means it's no longer a gaming tool. Um, you really want to keep it dedicated to communication and you need to put it in a really great sturdy case because the first time that iPad goes flying across the room will probably be the last time it is a functional communication tool. Um, they're not designed to withstand that much um, tossing about, but they can be a really appropriate tool. And sometimes they're a quick and easy way for us to get students started with communication. Um, some I know some families will start there because they need to get something in place at home and they have an iPad. Um, high tech, no, you can go on to high tech and then we can move into high tech options. Now those high tech options, they are designed to be sturdy. They are designed to be a dedicated communication device. Um, they have a longer battery life. They have a louder volume control output. Um, and there are many different types of software out there that you can get these devices for. And this is where things start to get really tricky for a lot of us. Um, but you can see how many stages of functional communication we just talked about before we ever got to high-tech communication, right? There are a lot of things we can put in place to get your students started communicating today because this piece um, requires a little more work actually probably a lot more work, um, but it's well worth it. These might be devices that are used for a couple of years. I've seen students get these devices and become verbal independently. I've seen students continue to carry over with these devices for the long term and their future. Um, there again there are different application softwares um the prc devices they have the accents the nova chats the via pro is changing a little bit um they're in the process of making adjustments and changes because this technology gets better every day and they make adjustments every day um dynavox is is still out there um and really my stance and my thoughts on these high tech pieces are that these students should own these devices. These are devices that um, you, uh, as a teacher, might be using at school, but this kiddo needs to travel with this device. So they should really own that device. And usually when I talk with parents, I talk with them about how to get through that funding process, and I support them through that process so that they have this at home. They have this when they go on vacation. They have this when they go visit grandma on the weekend. They have this if they move to a different school. Um, and it's important that it remains consistent and for the student's communication. All right, next slide. So you can't read this, but my point in putting this slide in here is these are the steps in getting funding for a communication device. So I know some of you have done that in the past um, and it feels like a lot because it is a lot. You're talking about buying a device that's in the seven to $10,000 range. And before insurance is willing to pay for that, um, they need to make sure this is really important for this individual. 
So it involves a lot of different steps. Um, and, and the team is really important in this process because you're going to need to trial the device for 30 days as part of that step and take data on how it's working out. And there are different ways that that can happen, but the important piece is that the entire team is trialing it over 30 days. So you can take that data and justify that, yes, indeed, this is the right tool with the right software for the student's needs um, and, and have that purchased for them. Um, you need information from the doctor including a, a recent visit note stating their need for communication supports, um, a very specific prescription form from the doctor that I usually fill out for them and fax over and say, please sign this if you agree and send it back to me. Um, and, and the evaluation component itself has a lot of steps for the speech language pathologist to complete around their ability to access a device and is this even appropriate for this student? Can they can they access it? Do you need different access tools? Um, what are the physical therapy supports that are needed? Any occupational therapy supports that are needed? Um, because there are things like key guards and switches and eye gaze and all kinds of of device options that you would you know want to discuss in this funding packet. So this is where things can get a little time consuming um, and, and tricky in terms, and then there's a waiting process. These devices are in demand right now. So sometimes, you know, it's being processed in, and you're waiting a few months to get it in your hands. Um, and there are, are different steps that, that families can take to try to um, get these components in place as quick as possible. But just so you know, this is not a fast process. Um, and, and your student needs a way to communicate in the meantime. So going back to thinking about those low-tech tools and those mid-tech tools, if your student has been using those up to this point, I recommend hanging on to them because you you may need them in the waiting process, but also if a device goes down and needs to be sent back for repair, we can't just expect our students not to communicate while we wait to get that device back. We pull out what they already know. We pull out those tools that are comfortable and familiar and keep the process moving. So I know that can be really complicated in the classroom um, and it is really complicated for the team and the team does need to dedicate some time um, to this process. But again, it can be a powerful and meaningful way to impact your student's future. All right. Next slide, unless there's a question about that or- Well, there's, there's a question that we're gonna hold off on until later around the medium level apps. Mm -hmm. um, but Tracy Whitlock, um, who's on my team, just shared that main site apparently has some of these devices. That might be new information, but um, that is something if you're wanting to understand and test. And also, you know, I know that Fran has said not all speech pathologists are very comfortable in understanding this process, but if you need support, you can call the Department of Education and we will help figure out for you who the best source of information is to get you the support you need. So I just wanna make sure you know that. And now I will advance the slide. No, but absolutely, I think that's an excellent point. Main site is a, is a great resource. Um, you know, some schools contract with Pine Tree Society has some, loaner type devices. Some of these programs will give the speech pathologist an evaluation loaner as well. Um, so there are lots of ways, but you know, the, the state certainly is here to help and support the process. So don't hesitate to reach out, um, certainly. Um, data collection becomes really, really important. Now, Erin's known me for a long time, and what she knows about me is as much as I hate numbers, and some of you know me, have known me a long time too, as much as I hate math, I know data collection drives any vehicle 
that we are trying to navigate. Every single one of them has to be driven by that data collection. And AAC is no different. We want to see what kids are doing, where they're doing it, and, and how we can duplicate that across settings. So as a team, it becomes really important then to decide what are those first critical communication skills we are all going to work on all day, every day, and what's the data we're collecting on that. So day in, day out, we're working on requesting a break or requesting help or making I want statements or responding appropriately to wait. You know, what are those skills that we are really targeting and how are we doing with that? So every participant should be filling out some data collection form um, to make sure we know what's happening. And that way we can figure out, wait a minute, what happened in the lunchroom that wasn't happening in the classroom? Like, where was the breakdown here? Um, what happened out on the playground? You know, I carry around a very old fashioned clipboard with a very old fashioned pen so that I can take data in the moment all the time. And um, it, it really becomes a great roadmap for figuring out where you're gonna go. And again, when you turn around to make those requests to purchase devices, you have all that 30 days worth of data to justify that purchase and to be able to say, this is the right tool. Because if it's not the right tool, you don't wanna keep hammering away at it. You gotta to switch tools to find the right one. And the only way you know that is by starting to collect data. So data collection. We do have a, a question. Uh, someone wants to know what type of data. So just, I'm going to just say some things and hopefully this is, it looks like this sheet, which you might not be able to see. Um, it looks like your the data you're taking is around what the team feels is what mm -hmm. you're trying to communicate. So mm -hmm. like, let's say the child is trying to request a break instead of having a crisis. Um, then you have developed a way of having the child request that communication and then you're documenting if it works. And this is probably something you don't even need a device for. You could do it in, in lots of different ways for the low tech and the medium tech and the high tech. You got it. Some of my data simply might look like break request. And then as you know, I probably have my paper divided over time. So I can see in what time period am I talking about? And then it's a very simple plus, minus, or either prompted or cued, right? So I might have plus, minus prompts written all over that sheet in different segments of time throughout the day. So I can start to see, are they starting to make requests? Are they successful with me prompting them or are they independent? where are the breakdowns happening and where are we not having success making those requests for breaks? Um, so then I can start to look at what's happening in that environment that's different. Is it too loud? Are there many people in there? Do we need to um, give a, a visual cue in that space? You know, what's happening and, and how, do we, how do we assess success and, and, and improving in that area. But I don't know if I don't take the data because sometimes I think things are either going horribly wrong, but when I look at my data, I realize, oh, we actually decreased the number of behaviors this day because the number of requests for breaks and help increased. And, and maybe that one behavior at the end of the day was really big, but all through the day, things were looking pretty good. Maybe we got to start looking at what the end of our day looks like is, is what that data is telling me. Um, so it's just really important that everyone is on the same page about picking what that skill is and are they successful to do it independently with cues, with prompts? How's that look for your group? So that, I hope that answered that question. It did. And so that participant also said, does that mean, you know, a lot of people might be taking data? And that is for sure true. Like there could be someone on who's monitoring on the playground or there could be a 
classroom teacher who needs to take some data, you could try to get a parent involved. And that could, you know, again, because you have to think of these things as not just living at school. They need to travel with them to other settings because, you know, if these kids can communicate effectively in school and no other area of life, that's going to be a hard a hardship when they, you know, leave school. So, <laughs> and, and how many times do we sit at an IEP meeting and do we say they're doing this with 82% accuracy? I'm pretty excited. And then you hear from another teacher or a parent, they're not doing that at all when they're with me, right? Because this does not just happen in the speech room or in the special education setting. Um, and if we're not making that translate, it's not a skill that we've mastered yet. Um, so it, you know, unfortunately for the teacher, what that might look like, and, and I'll do this in a lot of places, a lot of times we have our wonderful um, paraprofessionals and ed techs taking data, and then I'm collecting them all. You know, usually there's a folder for everyone to put them, and then I'm looking at them and trying to make the picture of what that data is telling me. And yep, I know what that means. That is more work. It is indeed more work. But I can tell you in the long run, once you get into the habit of just reviewing that data, even if it's once a week, it lets you know your next step. And then you don't need to spend a lot of time thinking about what's the next step? Why are we stuck? I know why we're stuck and I know what my next step is because I looked at all the data we collected. So it just, it becomes a really clear roadmap once you get your process down that works for you. All right, next slide. Even though I could talk about data collection all day long because I feel like it makes me happy. So a lot of um, our younger students do come into us with picture exchange communication systems. And again, if you're working with a preschooler that has a PECS book, please send it to school with them when they go to school because nothing makes me feel more sad than hearing from a teacher that said, I'm understanding my student used to use a PECS book, but we don't have it. That's, that's unfortunate because we as the receivers of kids in public school really need to use whatever they've been using. So it doesn't really even matter what system they were using as preschoolers. That's where we're starting. We're not changing languages on them. We're going to start with where they've been successful and can communicate with us effectively. There are many phases to PECS and back before technology was so easily accessible, we really wanted students to go through all of the phases. Now, the change in climate is if we can get the students through the first couple of um, phases of PECS, really, we're talking about communicative intent and the ability to exchange a picture for a highly desired item to traveling across the room to a communication partner to exchange that picture, um, and maybe even building an I want object sentence strip that they exchange, then you really got to start looking at, okay, my student's building a whole bunch of I want sentence strips. Is it time for more? And it might be because we also can use these high-tech or even mid-tech systems to start teaching more language um, because these systems are using um, predicted vocabularies and categorized vocabularies, depending on which software system ends up being right for the student. There's typing available if the object or the picture is not in the array that you have, and that student can't communicate what they need. You may have a tantrum, and I have a lot of students that can write a lot of words that I did not know they knew until they had the ability to do a little bit of, of keyboarding on an AAC device. Um, and, and you all know how hard it is to know what someone is talking about when you don't have the content knowledge. They could be talking about a movie they saw or a commercial they saw or their favorite TV show, and you have no idea what's happening. So being able to open that up with technology is something to be considering. We 
you know, we don't need PECS books that get bigger and bigger and bigger by the day. And I don't know about you guys, but at some point I get really tired of recreating and laminating and using Velcro and sending that stuff home. It starts to become more labor intensive than getting the mid or high tech option. And it could be limiting to your students' communication. I do like starting with PECs because I do like using PECs as a way to get this functional communication up off the ground, to get that communicative intent, and to start establishing how powerful communication is with a student without worrying about programming a device. I will say that, but there comes a point in these phases when you start to think about when are they ready to progress to another system? And so that is something to keep in mind. And again, you will always find me with board maker, laminated, Velcroed symbols all around wherever I'm at. But at some point, it becomes limiting to the student. So just think about now, if PEX is your student's best option, then I say keep going with it. Um, but don't be hesitant to try other options, even if you think they might be challenging for your student because you might be surprised. And again, those Logan texts are, can be great because you can put texture and objects on them if you're worried about your student being able to see the icons. Um, the icons on those systems, the sizes can be adjusted on a lot of them, the contrast, the backlighting, you can change up a lot of pieces. Um, you can make, uh, you can get devices that are smaller, you can get devices that are larger, they can be mounted. There's so many options out there today that didn't exist even five years ago. Um, that it is worth exploring. And I know a lot of people have familiarity with PEX, so sometimes it just feels really like a good place to start. And I agree with you. It just doesn't mean that's your end point. Can I ask a clarifying question? Mm -hmm. So I think that I learned this from you. I want to check my knowledge that you should, if you are keeping PEX at the word level, then that is limiting a child's mm -hmm. language development. Absolutely. In other words, you should be gearing for a full sentence because yes. language is connected. And if you keep doing the, I, you know, I want something and I'm just going to point to the picture without having the full sentence, you're actually limiting the use of that tool. I Am never I stay with, I never stay with a single picture. It, it, whether I'm going to the I want sentence strip or moving on to another device, um, that's not communication, right? And if you think back to those stages of communication and those important critical communication skills, requesting what you want was kind of that first skill after communicative intent. But you're not going to get to some of those other pieces if you don't move into sentences. I mean, verbs are a really important part of communication. It's not all about nouns, right? It's not about all about things we want. Um, it could be about things we don't want, but verbs become important and we have to start making sentences. So if, and, and what I could tell you is when you start making sentences on that sentence strip with, you know, I want to eat pizza, I've now done a lot of work to find and pull all those symbols down onto a sentence strip and exchange it with you. It'd be a lot easier if I were just tapping it out. And I could really start to expand my sentences. And I've seen lots of lots of students, you know, go from I want pizza to a device where they're saying, I want to eat pizza, please, with very little teaching needing, you know, I just need to show you where the steps are and show you how to build that sentence. And now you've got a whole world of sentences you can start to make in that device. Did that clarify, Erin, what you were it thinking? It did. It did. I just think that um, PEX is really user-friendly in a lot of ways, but if it's, if you are staying with that just one noun situation for too long, you're not advancing. And as, as you said, Fran, like doing all that with is, is 
it'd be much easier on an even like an iPad or one of the medium tech apps that you have around just sent, saying sense. You're kind of opening and expanding the language development at that point, which is what we need, right? Yeah, exactly. So and you can start to announced. teach language structures when you have things more available to you. And again, if you think about a PEX book, it's really limited to what you as the instructor have put in it. The, the kids not putting stuff in that PEX communication book. The adults are. <laughs> so the kid might want to talk about something completely unavailable to them in that PEX book. I don't want people to think that we're dissing PEX though. I, think I love PEX. Awesome. I use it on the regular. Yeah. And also, you know, thinking about text like for a visual schedule, that is super helpful. It's a great way of using text, especially for, I you know, use, if you're trying to get the routines down. And I use the weight component of PEX all the time because I really like how they have the visuals for that to support that level of delayed gratification. And, um, you know, that's where I, that's my go-to starting point every time because it really teaches kids communicative intent and the ability to have distance from their communication partner but still get the message across. And I think that is the most critical skill to start to start teaching kids. I think it's just a really good point to make. Like if you can't have a conversation with someone about what you need or what you want, you are going to be frustrated. And that comes out in different ways. So again, you're not going to be able to communicate that if you stay at that word level for too long. It's just my point. And, and the hard part, too, with all of these systems is it's really so easy to, to want to make sure that our kids aren't fixating on certain words or things they really want to, to say repeatedly that's, that aren't functional pieces of communication. But that's our job to shape that behavior, right? Not remove that word. Um, I had a student that had a communication device and she wanted to say the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And it had nothing to do with anything that was communicative. And I addressed it like I would address any verbal student who was saying something repetitively. It's not time to talk about that right now. That's not what we're talking about right now, right? And I'm redirecting them to task. So this is their voice. Wouldn't remove anybody's larynx and uh, not allow them to communicate, but I am going to try to shape that behavior. And, and you'll see it with kids all the time. I was sitting with a kiddo once and it was circle time at the beginning of the day and everyone's doing their calendar and he is just really wanting to talk about something that's very off topic. And I just kept redirecting to task because if he was verbal, what would I do? I would redirect him, right? That That's your job. Someone in the chat or in the Q&A said that they love the PEX 4 plus the app 2 after communicative intent is established with the sentence strip. So obviously PEX has come a long way since I've used it. <laughs> so, it, it absolutely has, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, and you really do want to get up to that sentence communication strip, you know, um, but then you got to start thinking about, am I limiting to what's just in this book? And does the student have more to communicate? And am I giving enough variety in sentence types and variety of, of communication opportunities? Um, but but I really very I I will use PEX frequently up through phase four, adding verbs, adding attributes, um, you know, and and getting those requests to happen. And then I'm starting to say, okay, I think the student has more. I think the student has more. Yep. All right. And I agree, don't stop using PEX. And again, if you're teaching preschoolers to use PEX, I'm going to say it one more time because I'm going to say it a hundred times. Please send that PEX book to school with that child. And we will also make sure to send those PEX book home with families. 
much. While you're making it, make three. It's and like, oh, I will also add a plug for parent training in your IEP. I mean, you can't send that thing home with the parent and expect them to understand what they need to do with it. So that might take a conference um, and some support. Just, uh, just keep that in mind. All and, right. And every parent will say to you, I know what they want. And they are right. They do. We do know what our kids want. I knew what my kids wanted and I would fall in that trap and I would get it for them, right? <laughs> Until I realized it was doing that. So explaining to folks that I get it. I get, you know, your kiddo. Here's how we can help them be a more powerful communicator by really having them communicate across settings. And here specifically is how you can help in that process. So that collaboration is important. All right, are we going to the next slide? Next slide. We talked enough about PECs. <laughs> I love pecs. I can't talk enough. Let me go to the next slide. <laughs> and, and we've done a lot of talking about this already too. Implementation. Work with what your student has. That's where you're starting. Send those systems from preschool to school. Apparently I wasn't done saying that <laughs> uh, after all. But when we're going to um, evaluate a system, set up a system, ask for systems to be used, no matter what they are, we really need to, to involve the parent in that process, and it is going to take additional time, particularly from the speech-language pathologist and from the IEP team. And I can already tell you, my brain does this too. When I start thinking about all the augmentative communication evaluations I'm doing right now, my brain goes, oh my gosh, there's not enough time. I'm not going to be able to handle it. And then I take a deep breath and I remember this is really important work and I find a way to handle it. Or I go talk to my administrators and say, hey guys, we got to figure this out. What are our resources? How can you help me get this done? How can you free me up? I need support, right? Because it, it will take extra time. And those are important conversations to have with your administrative staff as well. Um, OTs and PTs, really important because we got to think about access. We got to think about vision, fine motor, are there mobility issues? Um, what kinds of pieces are we looking to incorporate into these systems? Um, and this AAC device has become your student's voice once you set it up. I went into a classroom once in, in a place that I love dearly and they were so excited to show me the very neat way they had space for all the PECS books and, and how everyone can see where they are and it's perfect. And then I thought, hmm, and I walked over to that very neat space and I took every PECS book down and I handed every PECS book to every child that is supposed to have them in their hands um, because <laughs> it's their voice. They need to actually be holding it. And a lot of the kids are so funny because they get so used to me just turning them back around. I'm not even, you going to go get your words and your, and your communication device and your, your, your job is to carry that. Your job is to bring that. That is your voice. I need you to own that. And that's where we start the process. Um, so remember, this is their voice and they need to have access to it all the time. Next slide. We cannot generalize just to school. We got to include home, community. But again, these things do not just happen in the speech therapy room. I know we get really into, you know, two times 30 minutes a week. That's your time in speech therapy in the room to kind of suss out and maybe teach a skill. But now it needs to be pushed out everywhere. So it needs to go with them, travel with them across the day, across the building, home, community. You, you, I've seen schools do awesome things where students travel the building, talk to the people in the office, they talk to the people in the cafeteria, they talk to the folks in the gym, you know, contrive communication tasks and start moving around the building and having kiddos communicate with all the members of their community. Um, track that data and the progress. What specifically are you asking them to do? And are they being successful? When are they successful? What prompts are working? When are they not being successful? And how do we problem solve that? We won't know that if we don't take the data. And it does require some regular teaming. 
not just with your school team, but also with the families. And Erin is going to tell you some fabulous advice around writing that teaming time into IEPs. Would you like to touch base on that? You're, I think you're muted. I am muted. <laughs> I'm muted. Um, a lot of people don't know that you can put parent training on an IEP. And it does not have to be, you know, it, it, typically parent training is um, front loading it as it can be, um, take a little bit of time, but then it's just kind of touching base and providing that data and seeing how they're supporting at home. You can also put um, team meetings, uh, like consultation meetings on your team, uh, for your team to look at this. And again, you have to think about communication across settings. Like, can they go up to the person in the cafeteria and request their food? Like, what are they needing to do functionally throughout their day? And how do they communicate that? Those things you can build into your IEP. And uh, they should be for someone who is going through this type of functional communication. So that's what I would say. Excellent. Wonderful. Uh, and so just kind of tucking that in, in your, you know, the back of your minds that this is an important step in the process. And yep, it's another one that feels like it takes time. But again, that helps things get off the ground. You know, everyone is, is in this for the same outcome. Kids that can effectively communicate independently. That's what we all want. It's what everybody wants. So being able um, to, to have a, a vehicle to make that happen, that's a pretty exciting thing, I think. So someone in the chat said, you know, are you restraining language for someone who's nonverbal? Are you, are you basically not supporting a nonverbal child in vocalizing their words when you're working on PECs? I would say no to that answer. You are not doing that. And can you talk about that a little bit? Absolutely. So one of the steps in PECs, honestly, is that sentence strip needs to be, or that symbol needs to be read out loud so that they are getting those um, verbal models all the time. Um, and we want those kids to access their books and use whatever symbols are in there to communicate and really encourage that. But we're also making those models for those kids all the time. And sometimes that can be a hard piece for people to remember. If I made a, I want bubble strip and I handed it to somebody, that person really needs to read it out loud. I want bubbles. And then they might be saying, no, nah, it's not time for bubbles right now. Thank you. Here's when we're going to use bubbles. Or they're going to say, sure, nice, nice asking for bubbles. Here are the bubbles, depending on what step you're in. But you're always validating what the verbal component is of that communication. Um, and you're always modeling the verbal piece because that is something for our students that will become verbal communicators. That's essential. You, you have to have those, have those models all the time. And we shouldn't be thinking about limiting or restraining anyone's communication at any time because again, that's Kids are going to let you know when there's a problem and it might come out as a behavior. So the more words we can give them and the more access to communication that, that we can support, the better. So again, even if it's a, you know, if there's something that a kid really loves, like I've had kids that have like love sea creatures, love sea creatures, and I'll put them in the pecs book. They love them. They want to talk about them. They want to ask to play with the toy sharks. and sometimes. I get a little pushback because that makes it really hard on the classroom staff when they have to say, no, it's not time for sea creatures a hundred times a day. But <laughs> it's still really important and it's shaping communication. Um, and sometimes I advise, put it on the visual schedule. Sea creatures right here on the visual schedule. So when you ask me for it, I can tell you when it's going to happen. And I'm not going to restrict your ability to talk about those things. That feel like that answered that question? I, I think it answered the question. I think um, the participant may have um, thought that by using PECs, you're not encouraging speech. 
but that's not true. There's also verbal utteration, you know, all like, the time, all the time. People are going to communicate by verbalizing. Uh, maybe they won't because they have no the structure not to make sound, but most people have sound and, and they're going to use it. And so, you know, if someone's saying a complex sentence and they're hard to understand, you have more information because you can read that sentence, but they're still saying it. And it's important for them to say it. If you can, if you can elicit and part that. of and part of that PEX training, when you go to a PEX training, is the importance of reading those symbols out loud, whether it's a single symbol exchange or it's a sentence strip, to be reading that back to the student um, as a model of language and verbalization. No matter what your response to it is, the first step as the receiver of that exchange is to read it back. All right, next slide. Next slide. Let's see if I can do it. I can. So again, what's it look like across the day? We've, we've talked about it a lot, but you're going to pick those targeted skills. Maybe it's one, maybe it's two, maybe it's three, but probably not more than that. And it's going to be all day, every day. You want to try to come up with opportunities for them to be using these skills 30, 40 times a day. Send them to the office with someone, send them to the cafeteria, send them, you know, to different classrooms, have teachers in the hallway that are all prepped and know what, what the task is. Um, and I see buildings do this incredibly well. And I love when I walk through a building and I see kids traveling around and, and talking to different adults in the building. And I'm like, oh my gosh, those are that's an amazing way to target all those skills right there so and you're taking all that data to show how powerful it is next slide You know, you can, there are a lot of strategies. You can have that closed style. The student can fill in the blank. Um, type piece. Sometimes I'll do that verbally. I'll do that by having a stationary I want piece right on the, the sentence strip. If I'm using PEX, if I am using a voice output device, I might show them the first few words and then let them fill in the last one. Um, there are lots of ways to use that closed style presentation to help support the students learn new sentence structures. Um, Nonverbal cueing, so very important, and they talk a lot about this in PEX training. Um, you can't fade verbal cues. You can fade visual or physical prompts um, by backing away, but you can't, you either are verbally cueing or not verbally cueing. So trying to, to use nonverbal cues to support that communicative intent so that you can fade supports as the student is ready. What you really want is to develop independence with whatever system you're using. You want lots and lots and lots of errorless learning so that they really, it particularly, you know, when you're starting a new device or a new communication system, so they know where everything is in their system and can get to it independently. Um, and in the beginning, you're going to be doing a lot of things you wouldn't normally do and say yes to, like, sure, we can blow bubbles right now because you just asked for them. There's lots of time down the road to be working on no or not now or here's when we're going to do it in the schedule after they started communicating independently. In the beginning, we're really rewarding that communicative intent over and over and over and over and over again. And then again, we can start to shape it as that student becomes more independent in their ability to communicate. And that's where visual schedules really come in handy when you're when you're starting to say this is when we're going to be doing that activity so yep barely important next slide can't talk about this enough either apparently <laughs> all day everybody every day <laughs> keep doing it gather that data find out what's working find out what's not working it really is the whole team. Um, like if you're going to have a student initiate request, great, that's your data collection. If you're gonna have a student respond to greetings, again, you're walking them around the building and having tons of people say hi to them and you're taking data on if they're responding or not and then prompting them to respond. 
that could be a that could be a skill that you're working on throughout the day. So lots of creative ways um, that we can work on that data collection. There are so many resources. This is not even a full list of resources. We even just talked about main site is a resource. Um, you know, I Asha, did find out, Fran, that Pine Tree is in main site. Oh, they, Pine Tree is collaborator. Mm -hmm. All right. Pine Tree is a spectacular organization that does great, great work um, with communication devices. Really, really love working with them. Um, and the American Speech Language Hearing Association also has a lot of great information on augmentative communication skills and work. Um, and then, of course, there's PEX. I think, you know, the PEX um, guide is. One, I, I carry it with me because I feel like there's so much good information in there about functional communication. But then there are all of the devices out there that you can find information on. Um, it, can, it can be a little bit overwhelming sometimes, but turn to your personal resources to help you know where to go next, including the state. Like Aaron said, they're there to help guide you along. Yeah, and you know, we could not show you that YouTube video because uh, the internet connection, which which Amanda has, is not good enough apparently to show a YouTube video. But I would encourage you to watch it because it is a powerful story of a person who is in college and is using a augmentative communication device. And she actually talks about her journey in school. Um, many people thought she was not able to learn because she couldn't communicate. And once her family advocated for one of these devices, she started being able to, you know, it was her communication tool and she uses it today. And it's it's an unbelievable story. It only is six minutes. And I, I'm sure you'll be blown away by what a system like that can do because I haven't ever in my career seen that level of use, but it was a very powerful video. So please do go back. We are going to revisit a previous question where someone would like you to talk a little bit more about the, um, I think we're at the question phase. We're at the question slide. Yep. So um, the previous question of, if you could talk about medium tech apps and mm -hmm. what some of those are. So again, I I love the GoTalk app. Um, it's it's uh, an inexpensive one. It's a really easy one to navigate. Um, GoTalk is, again, it can be a standalone device, but it is also an app um, that you can download on any iPad, tablet type device. Um, so I think GoTalk is a really good medium step. Um, I, I do, I even, you know, Touch Chat has a free trial, but I do consider that a little more of a high tech because the software involved in that is more complicated than GoTalk. Um, so I like Touch Chat a lot because I feel like there are a lot of different vocabularies and options. But if you're talking mid tech, really one of the ones that I would, I think is the most flexible and the easiest to use is the GoTalk app. Um, there's Proloquo to Go, which I, I, I like that one a lot, but I find it to be a little expensive if you're not sure you're going to stick with that for a long time. Um, there, there's, an, there's Proloquo for text, which is interesting for some of our older students as well, um, where you can, it, it lends itself to more typing of messages uh, and then reads them out loud. Um, but I also like there's one called Verbally, uh, which is a great mid-tech um, typing type app. Now, what I can tell you about all these apps is they also change all the time. So one minute you've got a great app and the next minute it doesn't exist anymore because the companies replaced it with something else. So the the standards that kind of stick around have been GoTalk and Proloquo. And I believe they both have some light versions um, just to experience them in trial versions. Um, but again, the trial versions kind of come and go depending on the, the company's willingness to release them at any given time. 
So um, someone would like to know if you could just touch base again on shaping behavior versus removing the word and how a social story about sticky thoughts aligns with this process. Oh, absolutely. You know, again, I'm really also really enjoy um, some of the Michelle Garcia winners, social pragmatic language components. So I'll, I'll talk a lot about rock brain thoughts or um, having a big reaction to a, a small problem kinds of thoughts and social stories about when it's time to talk about something, I think can be really important um, to talk about, you know, I like to talk about, I'm just going to say sharks again, because I have a student right now that's really into sharks. Um, I can talk about sharks at this point, these times during my day. If I talk about sharks at other times, I'll be reminded that it's not time to talk about sharks right now. Um, and that's okay to do. And it's actually really important for our kids to start to learn some of that delayed gratification and some of that flexible thinking. And that's about social communication. You know, when once we get our kids the tools to functionally communicate, they need to learn some of the boundaries of social communication. You may have tantrums. You may have behaviors. Um, I think using a social story as a way to shape that is a wonderful idea. I also will use um, picture cues like a quiet, a quiet picture um, or, you know, helping them request a break to leave the activity for a minute to collect yourself, to come back together um, when it's more time to talk about those activities. Um, and, and you're absolutely correct in thinking that once we get some functional communication going, you might see a change in behaviors and an uptick in them. Well, I've requested it. Shouldn't I get to talk about it right now? Not necessarily. So shaping those behaviors either with positive reinforcers like token boards. You're doing a great job being on topic. You're doing a great job being on topic. You're doing a great, great. Now we can talk about sharks. You earned five tokens. You know, whatever it is you need to do, use those behavior, positive behavior reinforcers that you already know work for your student is what I would advise you. You're on mute again. I was just saying it's getting dark in my house, so I'm starting to get uh, front lit. Um, I think that that is all the questions we have. Uh, we are going to send you the um, the recording of this and also all of the materials that come with this. Um, you can, on YouTube, uh, search for See Us hear us, Jordan Zimmerman, and we'll probably find that video. If you're dying to see it, it is very worthwhile. And um, other than that, I think that we're complete. I'm so glad that you were all here today. Yeah. Um, and I hope you got something out of it that you can use tomorrow when you walk back in the classroom. And That's if you have further questions or you think of them later, please let us know and we will get you the information you need. Um, and thank you for helping us with our being patient with our technical problems early on and have a great weekend, everyone. Bye everybody.